All right, everyone. This is Danielle. You already have fans. She's going to talk to you about a day in the life of a sport therapist. I see a couple of your fans already walking in here. So I'm going to leave. Go for it. Okay. Okay, guys. So I know there's a lot of information out there in regards to sport therapy in terms of techniques and the difference between pre and post massage treatments. And while all that is great, I think one of the things I get asked about the most is what's it like to have boots on the ground at a major games? So what I'm going to go through today is to try and give you some insight into the day in the life of a sport massage therapist at a major games. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, I did kinesiology degree at U of T and then I went to Sutherland Chan, became a registered therapist. I got my first national team athlete while uh, as a referral from one of my U of T professors and then went on to work with athletes in the NBA, the NFL, um, other professional leagues. And for the last 10 years, I've been fortunate enough to be able to travel with uh, Canada Track and Fields or Athletics Canada. So today my talk is going to relate to my time spent on the road with the team traveling to major multi-sport games. So when I say a multi-sport games, what I'm talking about is where countries from all over the world come together and the athletes play different sports and they live in what's called what's known as the village. So like, for example, the Olympic Village. In the 10 years I've been with um, Athletics Canada, I've been fortunate enough to um, be able to attend two Olympics. I just came back from my fifth Worlds, two Pan Ams, two Commonwealth Games, and then probably about 40 or 50 other camps and competitions in total. So. You guys, when you're working at a multi-sport games, I just want to preface, there are actually two options. So the first one is you can work with core medical and that's where you're going to be in a, a clinic and that's going to be in the Canada house and you'll be treating athletes from all different sports that are Canadian. Um, you'll actually get some, I think there's also the opportunity to go to venues and be able to treat them in that venue, but you're going to be treating most of the teams without their own medical. So the second option is to work with an NSO, and that's a natural sport, national sport organization, and that would be with like Athletics Canada or swimming. And that's the option that um, I've chosen and that I'm going to take you through today. So Athletics Canada has a pool of therapists from around the country, and you'll get chosen to do different camps and competitions throughout the year. And then from that, they'll they'll choose a core medical to travel to the major games that year. So some years it'll be the Olympics, some year it might be a Pan Am, it might be Commonwealth Games. And you all work together as um, a medical staff and travel to that team. So a lot of people ask me, well, how do you get chosen for that? So once you're in the pool, it's a matter of reaching out, sending an email, you get in a pool. Um, I'm not sure what the percentages are, but chances are you can get sort of an invitation to sort of a, a camp where you're actually volunteering and then kind of work your way up. One way to do that, and um, of course, like anything else, there's multi different factors and a lot of th different things come into play. But one of the ways they do it is feedback from the athletes, the coaches, as well as the other staff. So guys, what it comes down to is how effective are your treatments? How well are you able to adjust to changing situations and things are changing all the time? And then how well do you play in the sandbox? How well do you get along with others? So guys, you've just been told that you've made your, ma your first major games and now what? So the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a gift in the mail. It's going to be a kit. They call it your gear. So for Athletics Canada, you're going to get a Nike kit and that's going to be all Nike gear. It's going to be two sets of luggage is you're going to get backpack, shoes, slides, rain jackets, water bottles, everything you could think of you're going to need. You're also going to get a sponsor kit, which would be for the two Olympics I was at, it was Hudson's Bay. So you're going to get a kit from Hudson's Bay, almost the exact same thing as Nike, because when you're at the track, you have to be in Nike. When you're in the village, you have to be in the sponsor's gear. So that's great. You've gotten all your, your gear, you've traveled to your destination. What I didn't mention is you're going to have to fit everything you need for the time that you're there in one suitcase. And the reason is, is because as a massage therapist, you're going to be traveling with that piece of luggage. You're also always going to have a knapsack on your back. It's going to be permanent. <laughs> you're going to have a massage table. And inevitably, if you travel with a medical team, you're going to have a Norma Tech. You're going to have a game ready. You're going to have vitamins and supplements. So there is no packing lightly in this job. Um, you will find a way to stack everything, so don't worry about that. But I will say, guys, it doesn't matter how often, how many teams you make. Putting the Canada, Canada gear on your back and walking through the airport with the team or being in the village with Canada on your back, there's nothing better. Um, I've been with Pride all the time and people are like, still, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, so now you're outfitted, you've traveled overseas to your destination. 
first thing you're going to do is get your accreditation. It's kind of like this. And guys, at this point, it is the most important thing you own. Um, it's the most valuable. Passport, everything, throw that out the window. This accreditation will be the only thing that gets you into the venues and gets you back into the village. I want to make sure you keep that safe. <laughs> so then you'll find the Canada House. And the great thing about Canada is we have enough sports, so again, multi-sports. So you'll all be staying in the same, it's like a low-rise condo. I've been to a couple games where they've had um, uh, stacked townhouses, but for the most part, Canada, we take up one whole building, which is great. If you're a smaller team, you share it with other countries. So the great thing is you're there with all the other staff, all the other athletes, some you've only seen on TV. Um, and so it's a great way to network, especially with other therapists, other medical staff, um, other coaches. Um, it really is an invaluable experience. You're going to be staying in dorm-like rooms. Don't worry, you don't spend much time in those rooms, but they are new. So they'll build this complex. And then once the games is over, they will go into some sort of community housing for that community. So everything's kind of roughed in. Like I said, you're not spending much time there anyway. Um, you're gonna, th this is a full facility, the village. Everything you're gonna need for two weeks is in that village. Now there's a good news, bad news situation. The good news is Canada generally takes the housing complex furthest away from the dining hall and the transportation depot. They say you can eat yourself out of a metal if you hang out in the dining hall. So Canada likes, and it's very noisy, it's where people from other countries, you meet up with people, you're hanging out, that's where you do it. Um, so it's great, you're furthest away from that, it's usually where the most noise is. As a therapist, the bad, the bad news is Canada gets the house furthest away from the dining hall and the transportation depot. We are schlepping stuff in the last two games I went to with 35 to 40 degree weather. There is transportation amongst the village, but depending on where the place you're staying is, it might just be you're halfway there if you start walking. So you usually end up schlepping all your stuff. So good news, bad situation. Now, if you know me, I'm just going to touch on the food because it's very important. The food at the games is 24 seven and it is free. The great thing is there are athletes from all over the world. So there is foods from all over the world, which is fabulous. Um, you're gonna have your main dining hall that's open, like I said, 24 seven after 2 a.m. The selection decreases and don't ask me how I know that. There will also be casual dining. So the cool thing is that's almost like a barbecue pit. Um, in Australia, they had kangaroo patties. In Lima, we had polenta fries. In Tokyo, they had like dim sum little boxes, bento boxes. So it's really cool where you go around the world. They will have staple things like French fries and rice and wraps for just everybody. But it's kind of cool to be able to try that. The other thing the Canada House has is a grab and go station. And so because you're coming and going all the time, there is a huge, probably five tables and you'll have fruit, you'll have granola bars, you'll have berries you'll even have junk food chips to sustain the staff not the athletes but that's the kind of thing where you go into the track you don't know really how long you're going to be there your schedule means nothing so you, your, your backpack is full of crap and ironically you end up giving most of it to the athletes because they never bring enough food I will warn you I did come back from my first major games in 2014 and walked into 7-eleven in Toronto and went to the fridge pulled out a drink grabbed a bag of chips and almost walked out the store because I hadn't paid for food in two weeks so I just warn you against that. The one thing I do want to touch on is the transportation. So the transportation depot, it's if you can imagine countries from all over the world, I don't know how many sports, but there's about 60 buses. So you got to find the bus you're supposed to get on. So I'm just telling you this precautionally. Just last year, and I've been to multi games, we we're in Belgrade, Serbia, and I'm going back to the track for the afternoon session with a veteran athlete. And I'm always early, take pride in that. So I get onto the bus that I usually sitting in the same place to go back to the track. The athlete's veteran, he's early too. Great, the bus takes off and we're like, oh, it's kind of early and it went a different direction, but not a big deal because depending on the time of day, the drivers take different ways to get there. Within a couple minutes, we realize we're not going to the competition track, we're going to the training track. It's not far. So not a big deal because during the training sessions, the bus usually went back to the hotel and you could just, we're, we're early, we're good. So we get to the training track and I ask when the bus is leaving to go back and he says an hour because competition has started. So I can't lie, my heart drops and I start to sweat profusely. So the athlete tells me that he's going to go to the washroom probably to do the same thing. So I go and find a volunteer, not many there, doesn't speak very good English, but I explain the situation and I don't even can't even imagine what I sounded like but I said I need a cab and I need it right away so she happened to get me a cab it was, came within three to four minutes great we're still early this is good 
So the cab comes and you just say, I don't know, visa. And he says, no. You say, okay. Um, so I have a translator. He only takes cash. Okay, so now, now I really start to panic. This athlete needs to get to track. At this point, I'm going to leave my driver's license. I'm going to leave my left foot. I'll offer a kid. It doesn't matter. This athlete has to get to the track. Well, being a Trini, my mother always said, make sure you have mad money. And that is, if anything happens, you have some money tucked away in your wallet to be able to get out of Dodge. So I happen to have American money stash in my wallet. So just so happens the cab driver that comes, his, we're in Belgrade, Serbia. His brother lives in London, Ontario, and his son goes to Kitchener Waterloo. So he takes a liking. He is driving on side of highways. I literally have to close my eyes because this athlete needs to get there in one piece. By the time we turn in, the bus that we were getting on had, was just leaving. So we were less than a minute late. So good news after all that is the athlete made it. Um, I didn't lose my job and the athlete made it into the finals and ended up seventh of the world. So lesson learned, always look for the sign on the front of the bus, regardless of where it's parked. Okay, guys, so now you're situated, you look the part, you're comfortable, and now the fun starts. So with track and field specifically, treatment happens in a couple of different ways. Unlike a sport where everybody finishes at the same time, a soccer team and everybody's done, they cool down at the same time, you're ready to go at the same time. One Olympics, we had over 65 athletes. That is 65 different schedules. So you can only imagine there are at a major games, two physios, two chiros, two massage therapists. So a lot of stuff happening, a lot of moving parts. Before competition begins, the staff is divided between going to the competi to the training tracks and then treating back in the village. Once competition starts, it's all hands on deck. You're either going to be at the competition track or you're going to be treating back at the village. Now, when um, before you actually go to competition, you usually had a training camp for about seven to 10 days where if your staff that live out, like your therapist that lives out in Alberta, you get to know the sprinters that train in Toronto. It's a way for everybody to come together, get to know everybody's preferences. So what the staff does, the medical lead is they kind of keep note of which athletes have a preference for which therapist. So when it comes time for competition, especially if they are a medical potential, you will be at the track with that athlete um, just for continuum of care, and that's obviously who they prefer. Um, so it's kind of kind of going to work that way for the most part, or you're again going to be back at um, the village treating. Now, the great thing, well, a bit of sarcasm here, but the great thing about track is there is no end time. Unlike other sports, when the game ends at 10:30. A runner can be done at 10, 1030. And you think by the, if it's the finals, they get through the media zone, they got to cool down. And if you know distance runners, their cool down is actually longer than the time they spend racing. So you could be looking at an hour, an hour and a half before you end your treatment with them at that night. And track is always one of the latest things that could go until 11 o'clock at night. Um, so there really is no end time. Last year, world championships, our men surprised the US, well, surprised the world, beat the US in the four by one relay, it took them an hour and a half to get through the mix zone because every media wanted to talk to them. So by the time they got back to us, it was an hour and a half later, they need to hydrate, cool down, and then they could get called for doping. Usually that will go to one of the doctors or maybe the sports psych, but I was at, um, in Rio, a quarter miler, she's the last um, event of the night and I'm treating her and she gets called for doping. So on top of her hour, hour and a half after the race, then we got to go to doping where there could be 40 people getting tested and 10 testers and everybody's got to pee on demand. So everybody's just waiting, tapping their feet, drinking. Um, so by the time we got back to the, um, the village, it was two o'clock in the morning. So the way it works is daily at competition time, the coaches that are in charge of certain athletes say to the manager, this is what time this athlete is leaving on the bus. This is what time they compete. This is what time their call room is. Um, and then we find out where we're going to be that day, whether you're at the track in the morning and the evening or whatever your, your thing may be. Well, I was on my, and it's called the duty sheet. And my duty sheet said that I was on the 6 a.m. bus the next morning after I'd just gone back to the village at 2. So that is what I talk about when I say you need to be able to just roll with it. You don't say anything to anybody. It is what it is. There's too many moving parts. You suck it up and there's one night where you don't get your full night's sleep. Um, in terms of, I would say, guys, the biggest thing with sport, and it's it really visible in track, is time management. You've got athletes that have just gotten off the track that might compete 
in another four hours. You might have somebody who keep, competes the next day. Some people, their career is over. The games is over. Um, and then you'll have, so you've got a list of about two or three people that'll be like, Danielle, how many more people do you have? Can I see you after? So you're keeping a mental list. If they are a metal potential and have to race, they're obviously first. So somebody whose games are done might come to you and they're last. So you'll tell them, you know what? You're the third one now. No big deal. They understand. Everybody knows how this works in track and field. But then it's about 2.30 and you've got two or three people that have said they want treatment from you. And then you have a metal potential who runs at 4.30. He arrives at 2.30 at the track and says, Danielle, can I get my pre-treatment at 3.30? Well, your table is going to be empty at 3.30. So what happens is, is about three o'clock, you're going to yourself, okay, the so-and-so is on my table. Do I stretch this out? Do I, you know, do the most effective tools I have to do what I need to do with them and then squeeze somebody else in? But somebody that's competing, whatever time they need their pre-treatment, they're on that table. Um, the other thing in terms of time management, and this is kind of lesson for everybody, I learned it the hard way, was I had an athlete that came to me. They had to be in the call room. They said, Danielle, I have 15 minutes. I can't get my right hamstring to, uh, to do what it needs to do. It's not feeling right. They're a bit panicked. I was like, cool. 15 minutes is actually a long time to be working on one or two body parts. So I was like, excellent. I'm going to start on the unaffected side, do three or four minutes and um, get that going. So I've done that. I've still got 10 minutes. I'm good. I've treated this athlete a lot. I know exactly what I got to do. Well, the coach pokes their head in the tent and says, I need her in five minutes. In my head, I'm like, what? <laughs> but outside, I'm like, oh yeah, of course, no problem. So at that point, you're going into your toolbox and you're finding your most effective treatment to release a hamstring in whatever position they are in, prone, supine, or sideline, which is why I do recommend you be able to treat these muscles in all different positions. So get that done. You got to play it off like that's that's what you meant to do the entire time. So now all that seems a little crazy. And some days it is really crazy. For the most part, it's controlled. Not everybody's competing every day or on that same day. You'll still have people that are back at the village because they don't complete compete for four or five days. So the good news is as crazy as that sounds, if you're back at the village, much more controlled. You're in time slots, um, half an hour time slots. What'll happen um, is you might get, they might be overwhelmed at the track and you'll get your slots filled up by the therapist at the track, filling them in for you if we're sending athletes back because there's too big of a lineup at the tent at the track. The other option is if, you, if you're full and you're at the village, we will call you and say, can you start early or end late? That's what I talk about being adaptable got to happen so either way you could you're probably going to start early and end late um so as crazy as it makes it seem guys if you ever get the opportunity and you, you're not sure if it's for you do it there's so much learning there's so much networking you really do work as a team you're always talking to each other helping each other out do you want me to do this on this person and you do that so do it I highly recommend it. In the 23 years I've been a therapist, it's some of the most rewarding work I've done. Um, so I hope I haven't been a deterrent. I just want to kind of let you guys know what it's really like to have boots on the ground. Um, so yeah, guys, good luck. I hope to one day be sitting where you are listening to you guys tell your stories about being at a major games. <laughs>